All right, so my computer says it's already six o'clock and that your lunch break is over. So we will start our second session today. And this time we will continue on proton PDFs, but we'll move also towards the nuclear PDF set. And our first speaker is Chris Kokusa. Chris, are you there? Hello, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, you have 18 minutes, that is 15 plus 3. I will let you know when you have two more minutes left of talk, and then you have three minutes for questions. So um, if you want to share your slides, please. Uh, can everyone see that? Uh, yeah, can you go? Yeah, go to full screen, please. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Chris Kakuza, and today I'm gonna to be showing the results of a global QCD analysis done uh, in collaboration with the Jefferson Lab Angular Momentum Collaboration, otherwise known as JAM. And this analysis was done on a simultaneous extraction of spin average PDFs and nuclear effects in uh, deuterium using uh, global deep inelastic scattering data, as well as uh, data on W and Z boson production. So uh, first, let me talk about JAM in general and what the goal of the collaboration is. So the ultimate goal is to understand the three-dimensional structure of nucleons uh, through global QCD analyses of uh, quantum correlation functions such as uh, parton distribution functions, which is what I'll be talking about today, but also other functions such as fragmentation functions and transverse momentum dependent functions. So in the case of collinear functions such as PDFs, uh, we use collinear factorization in perturbative QCD to perform uh, simultaneous determinations of these functions. So that includes spin average PDFs, helicity PDFs, uh, fragmentation functions, and more. Uh, we utilize Monte Carlo methods for Bayesian inference in order to achieve uh, the most robust uncertainty quantification uh, that we possibly can. So that is JAM in general, but this analysis in particular uh, focuses on spin averaged PDFs as well as nuclear effects in deuterium. So we perform, so there's two major goals of this analysis. The first is to perform a simultaneous extraction of spin average PDFs, nuclear effects, as well as higher twist effects. So these higher twist effects go as X squared, M squared over Q squared. Uh, M here is just the mass of the proton. X is the parton momentum fraction in DIS and Q squared is the four momentum transfer squared in DIS. So uh, based on this, these effects are rel most relevant at high X and low Q squared. So in order to include that data, we need a low cut on the invariant mass squared, which I will show on the next slide. So the second goal of this analysis is to update uh, previous JAM unpolarized analyses with the latest WZ boson production data. And that includes uh, the latest data from the Large Hadron Collider. And later I will show what impact that has on the PDFs. So this is a global analysis, which means we use data from many different processes. Uh, among them are uh, deep inelastic scattering, Drellian, as well as W boson production. So we have these processes and we have a bunch of data for all of these processes. And here is all of the data um, included in this analysis displayed uh, on the X Q squared plane. So we have nearly 4,000 uh, points for deep inelastic scattering. And that includes uh, fixed target data, such as from Jefferson Lab and Slack as well as collider, uh, and that data is most relevant at high X. And we also have collider data from HERA, which is uh, more relevant at low X. For gel yon, we have 250 data points from Fermilab. And for WZ boson production, we have over 200 data points from uh, Tevatron and the Large Hadron Collider. So these points here are the uh, new LHC data that we are including in this analysis. 
And as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, we need a low W squared cut, in this case of 3G V squared, uh, in order to include the high X data, uh, particularly from Jefferson Lab, which lives entirely in this region uh, between 10 and 3 uh, W squared. So this is the high X data that allows us to extract the nuclear effects because uh, it includes not only proton targets, but also uh, deut the deuteron as a target. So uh, with all of this data, uh, let me give a brief summary of how we actually extract the PDFs. So we parameterize the PDFs at a chosen input scale. In this case, it's the mass of the charm core. And this is an example of uh, how we parameter parameterize the PDFs uh, with these five parameters, N, alpha, beta, gamma, eta. Uh, we then evolve the PDFs using to uh, the required scale using the DGLAP evolution equation. And then we can compute the observables and calculate the chi-squared. Then once we have the chi-squared, we can determine uh, the most likely parameters uh, for this function through Bayesian uh, posterior sampling with the uh, given likelihood, func uh, likelihood function, which depends on the chi-square. So a few uh, more details about the analysis is that we use uh, data resampling. So uh, we generate pseudo data uh, by taking the original data and adding some random Gaussian noise that is weighted by the quadrature sum of the uncorrelated uncertainties. And another strategy that we use is uh, what we call a multi-step strategy. So uh, we start off uh, with a relatively simple scenario. So for example, just including DIS data and fitting PDFs. And then in subsequent steps, uh, we add more complicated processes and more complicated distributions. So in the next step, we might add Drellian, then we might add uh, W boson production, or we might add the nuclear uh, functions that are going to be fit. Then in the final step, we take those parameters uh, as the final result. So uh, using that, we're able to get a fit to the data. So this is just uh, showing the fit to some of the data that's included in our analysis. So in this case, I'm showing a neutral current DIS data. On the left here is proton. On the left, right here is deuteron. You can see we have data from Slack, uh, Jefferson Lab, Hall C, Hera, uh, et cetera. Here is uh, some more data on WZ boson production from Tevatron. But most impo importantly is the uh, lepton production data from the Large Hadron Collider which is uh, we are including in a JAM analysis for the first time. So in the top left here is a proton, anti-proton data from Tevatron, but everything else here is a proton, proton data from the LHC. So uh, for the LHC data, we achieve a chi-squared over degrees of freedom of 1.35, uh, showing that uh, even with the incredibly high precision of the data, it is still uh, possible for us to achieve a good fit to the data. And uh, for all of the data in the analysis, uh, we have a chi-squared over degrees of freedom of 1.11. So we are able to uh, get a good fit of all of the data simultaneously. So uh, fitting all of that data, these are the actual results for the, P for the spin averaged PDFs. So on the uh, top left, we have the valence quarks, we have the gluon, uh, the middle row has the anti quarks, or the light C quarks. Uh, the bottom left here is the strange quark, and then we have the ratio of the strange quark uh, to the light C quarks. And on the right here, we also have the D on U ratio. So a few of the features that stick out from our analysis is that we have a large C asymmetry at low X. And uh, within our analysis, we find that this is due to the LHC data, which uh, I will show in more detail on the next slide. We find that the D on U ratio is well constrained up to about uh, X of 0 0.85. But beyond that point, um, 
we do not know much about the D on U ratio. And finally, we find a, uh, at low X, we find that the DV distribution, the down valence is uh, suppressed relative um, to the other uh, extractions. And correlated with that is we find that a very large strange distribution at low X compared to other analyses. So in this slide, I'm showing all of the same PDFs, uh, but this time uh, with and without the LHC data. So the results without the LHC data are shown in yellow. And this allows us to see the impact that the LHC data has uh, on the PDFs. And we can see that it has um, very, it does provide very strong constraints on the U and D quarks uh, below, at low X below 0 0.2, as we can see here. Uh, the most striking result is uh, for the C asymmetry uh, at low X. Uh, we find very strong constraints are placed on this from the LHC data. And for the D on U ratio, we also find um, some powerful constraints from the LHC data at low X below uh, 0 0.3. So that was the first half of our analysis on uh, the PDFs. So now I want to focus on the second half, which is the extraction of nuclear effects. But before I go into the results, let me give a brief summary of uh, what is going into this analysis. So as I said before, uh, we include data on deuterium, which means that, uh, uh, which means that nuclear effects are important. And by extracting the nuclear physics uh, combined with perturbative QCD, uh, this can provide further insights into the dynamics within nuclei. So as one example, uh, we can look at the uh, ratio of the deuteron structure function F2 uh, to, the, uh, to the sum of the proton and neutron structure functions. And this is related to the F2n neutron over F2 proton ratio which is then related to the D on U ratio. And uh, these are the results from two previous extractions. And you can see uh, that the results are quite different, which will then lead to uh, different results for the D on U ratio. So when I say uh, the when I refer to the nuclear effects that we are extracting, uh, what I'm referring to are the off shell effects. So these off shell effects take into account that the uh, Nucleons within a nucleus may be off shell, as in their uh, four momentum squared might be different than their mass squared. So the uh, structure function for a nucleus can be written as a convolution of the nuclear structure functions. And these nuclear structure functions can then be uh, Taylor expanded uh, to first order in this uh, quantity we call V which is a measure of the off shell, uh, the off shellness of the nuclei. So we assume this quantity is small and only expand the first order. <clears throat> and then the coefficient of that term, uh, we call delta Fn. And this is what we parameterize directly and try to extract uh, from the deuterium data. So with all of that, uh, these are our results. Since we're only including deuterium data, we assume uh, delta F proton equals delta F neutron and call it uh, delta F zero. Please two minutes. So our results here are shown in red compared with the CJ15 and KP results. Uh, you can see that they are uh, consistent with zero throughout the entire range of X. And we find the reason for this is uh, tension between the Jefferson Lab and SLAC data, which are the most relevant data sets at high X. So if we include only the Jefferson Lab data, we get this yellow curve. Whereas if we include only the SLAC data, we get this blue curve, which is basically uh, the opposite of the yellow curve. So when all of the data sets are combined, uh, these two curves essentially cancel out and give us something that's close to zero. Uh, but we do find that our result is consistent regardless of the choice of parameterization or the uh, theoretical model choices that we take. And that includes the choice of Deuteron wave function. 
So uh, in conclusion, we find that the new LHC data provides uh, strong constraints at low X on the valence quarks, the C asymmetry, and the D on U ratio. We find a C asymmetry that's large at low X, a down valence that's small at low X, and a strange distribution that's large at low X. For the off-shell corrections, we find that they are uh, consistent with zero due to tension in uh, the Slack and Jefferson Lab data sets. And we find this result is consistent uh, regardless of uh, the choices we make with regards to parameterization or the model. So in the future uh, for the nuclear effects, we obviously look forward to uh, new data from Jefferson Lab uh, at high X uh, in order to deter get more information on the off-shell corrections. In particular, we uh, look forward to Marathon with its tritium and helium targets, as well as Bonus with its neutron targets. And obviously for the PDFs, uh, we look forward to the EIC. In particular, parity violating DIS at the EIC could provide uh, more information on the strange distribution, which is uh, a distribution that we still have a lot to learn about. So thank you to my collaborators and thank you everyone for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for being on time. Uh, so we have three questions. Let's start with Emmanuel because he raised his hand first. Yeah, I'd like to ask a clarification about the perturbative accuracy of your PDF analysis. Is this next to leading order or next to next to leading order in QCD? This is uh, next to leading order. Okay, thank you. Uh, and when, when, and sorry, if I can ask an, yes, a similar question, what prevents you to repeat the analysis at next to next to leading order? Mentor, uh, I guess, or but I believe uh, we just uh, we don't have that implemented uh, into the jam analysis yet but it's something uh, we could look into in the future. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move to Robert. Um, hi, on page five, you explain how you uh, obtain the pseudo data and you say that it's by shifting the data uh, by using a quadratic sum of uncertainties. So does that mean you're not taking into account correlations? Uh, so in the generation of the pseudo data, the correlated uncertainties are not taken into account. But um, in the calculation of the chi-squared, uh, we do take the correlated uncertainties into account, as well as the uh, normalization uncertainties. So when you say the calculation of the chi-squared, that's, that's just for your central best fit or... Uh, so it's done. Uh, we have uh, we submit multiple uh, replicas, each one with a different set of parameters, and the chi squared is uh, calculated for each replica uh, with their own sets of parameters. Okay. Okay. Well, again, it's a sort of isn't isn't it? Wouldn't it be correct? To shift the data also taking into account the correlations. That I'm not sure of. <laughs> uh, yeah, hi, uh, can you please go to slide nine? Okay, um, so I have two questions about this. Um, so first of all, um, it doesn't seem that uh, the GEM uh, uh, analysis excludes uh, or rules out that this favors other uh, fits by, by other groups like an NPDF on 3.1 uh, or CET18 for the same reason. Uh, and the second question is that looks like the GEM uncertainty is larger in the 20th set than in the, in the previous generation in the red line. Uh, th does this mean that after including more data, the uncertainty will grow even more? So the uh, JAM20 analysis was done uh, on, uh, 
it was a simultaneous extraction of PDFs and uh, fragmentation functions. So I believe it was pion, kion, and hadron fragmentation functions from semi-inclusive DIS. Yes, but the, the, this data that you show, that these distributions are not affected by series. Anyway. So, so in the uncertainty went up in GEM20 compared to GEM. So uh, what's the reason? Oh, uh, so this, uh, so the GEM20 uh, band actually has less data. Uh, it only includes uh, DIS data and drill yon. Uh -huh. Whereas the red band, which is uh, this analysis includes uh, all of the data I mentioned before. So the red band has more data than the pink band. Okay, so then the pink band uh, rules out the red band to some extent. Oh, uh, you said it rules out? Yeah, because the error bands do not overlap. Right, well, uh, I would say in turn, uh, if we're looking at the PDFs, I would say the red band uh, is the more trustworthy answer here because uh, these are different analyses with different uh, data sets. But in terms of PDFs, this is the analysis that has uh, more data, relevant data. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Gunnar, question? Yeah, I guess I just have a quick question. Since you have a rather loose cut on W square, what prevents you actually to use the, the Hermes data on, F, on inclusive DIS? Uh, yeah, so I believe there's an issue with the Hermes data in a certain, in one of the bins. So uh, there's actually, there is nothing uh, excluding us from using the Hermes data, uh, except for that problem. But uh, due to that issue, we just uh, we decided not to include it in this analysis. What is the issue actually? Uh, I believe uh, in one of the uh, X bins in the Hermes data, there is tension with the rest of the fixed target data, so it cannot be uh, fit simultaneously with the other data unless you uh, cut out that data that conflicts. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, so thank you. Great, and thank you for the questions for all the others. Cool. Uh, so now let's move to the next talk. For, uh, that's uh, by Rosalind Pearson, and it's about the deuterium and nuclear effects on uh, NMPDA. So, uh, Rosalind, if you can share your slides, please. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, put it. Now we can. <laughs> Okay, so, um, hi everyone, I'm Rosalyn. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Edinburgh University and I'm working with NMPDF. And today I'm gonna to talk about the next generation of NMPDF PDFs. Hi, uh, and can, I can, see it. Oh, can you see it? Not yet. It's we we, oh. we can see the slides, Rosalyn. Oh, okay. Um, I wonder why. Maybe you, oh, can. we can see them now. Okay, amazing. Um, yeah, okay, so in particular, um, I'm going to talk about the inclusion of deuteron and nuclear uncertainties. Um, okay, so just this is a quick overview of the talk. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a bit about what nuclear uncertainties are, why we need them, and how we can deal with them. Then I'll look at the uncertainties for the heavy nuclei, so things like copper, iron, and lead, separately to the deuteron uncertainties. And for each type, I'll explain how we determined uncertainties and how we included them in the fits. Um, and then I'll show you what the impact is at the PDF level before wrapping things up. Okay, so uh, why, why do we need nuclear uncertainties? So basically a wide range of data is needed to pin down the form of PDFs. And that includes those where the proton is not in a free state. So more precisely, it encompasses DIS and Drell-Yam fixed target measurements, which involve deuterion and heavy nuclear targets. Um, and then in these cases, the proton's interaction is altered due to the surrounding nuclear environment. And this difference will propagate through to the fitted PDFs, which leads to an unwanted shift in their central values and uncertainties. Um, we can't just discard the data because they play a crucial role in determining the strangeness content of the proton uh, and also the, the light flavor separation at high X. Um, and it's also a region which uh, at high X is important for the understanding model searches. So. 
um, given we can't uh, just discard them, how do we deal with them? So there have basically been quite a few wide ranging studies of deuteron and heavy nuclear corrections in the past. Um, and there are two main approaches we can take. One is to uh, use a model to correct the central value of the theory of predictions. And the other is to estimate nuclear uncertainties using um, nuclear PDFs um, to uh, empirically see what the, the uncertainty of the difference should be. And this is the se second approach which we adopted in NMPDF 4.0 and which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so yeah, in, in the past, basically, deuteron, deuteron corrections have been included in previous PDF determinations using nuclear smearing functions um, based on deuteron wave function models, uh, and the heavy nuclear corrections have been included following a series of nuclear models or fitting to the data. But using those models can be unreliable. They can introduce a bias. So in the past, NMPDF basically opted to just ignore the nuclear effects um, on the assumption that they're small. Um, however, this is another source of uncertainty, and it's becoming increasingly important to um, take another look at as PDF precision is increasing. Um, so, how do we take an empirical approach? So, if we take a step back and think about where the problem is when using the nuclear data, um, well, we're calculating nuclear observables, but we're using the proton PDF to do that, and instead we should be using the corresponding nuclear PDF. Um, which means that the correction or the shift can be identified with the difference between the nuclear observable calculated with a proton PDF and the correct uh, nuclear, and nuclear observable calculated with the correct nuclear PDF. Um, but of course, the nuclear PDF itself does come with an uncertainty, so we also need to include that uncertainty. Um, and we can do this by considering a set of shifts for the predictions with each nuclear PDF replica uh, relative to the prediction with the central value of the proton PDF. And then we use the theory covariance matrix formalism that we previously developed in NMPDF um, to construct a theory covariance matrix. And it allows us to include theory uncertainties by just adding the theory covariance matrix, which is this S here, to the experimental covariance matrix when we're doing a fit. So before moving on to implementation, I'm just going to quickly review the nuclear data in NMPDF 4.0. Uh, this table shows all of the nuclear data sets, um, their corresponding observable on the target, and overall in 4.0 there are about 4,000 data points, and roughly 10% uh, of that comes from deuteron data and 20% from heavy nuclear data. Um, and we opted to consider these two types of nuclear data separately on the basis that effects in heavy nuclei, such as iron, will be quite different from that in deuterium, which is just one proton and one neutron. Um, okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about heavy nuclear uncertainties first. Um, we can include them uh, using the covariance matrix that I just talked about. Uh, and the nuclear PDFs that we use to construct this um, are those from N and NPDF 2.0, which are available at uh, next to leading order at the moment. And we can use those PDFs to construct these um, deltas, which act as contributions to the covariance matrix. Um, and we can also take a more ambitious approach where we try to correct or basically shift the predictions for the nuclear observables by adding this uh, delta T term. And if we do that, we need to amend the contribution to the covariance matrix so that they're relative to the shifted prediction. Um, and we'll call these two approaches the deweighted approach and the shifted approach, um, of approach respectively. Um, so in order to uh, understand the pattern of the nuclear uncertainties. Uh, it's helpful to look first at the nuclear observables. So this is what we've got here is just a ratio um, of the prediction with the nuclear PDF to that with the proton one. And the uncertainties here come from the uncertainty in the nuclear PDF. Um, oh yeah, so just to mention within each experiment, the data are arranged in Q squared bins and then there's increasing X in each bin. And you can see there's a clear uh, downward shift at the high X um, area of the bins, which is a direct consequence of the ratio of the nuclear to the proton PDF. So that the nuclear shadowing um, pulls the nuclear PDF down in the high X region. And you can see that, especially for chorus uh, neutrino data here on the left, um, there's quite a poor agreement within uncertainties because there's this sort of systematic shift. Um, Okay, so, so now let's look at the uncertainties on each data point before and after adding the covariance matrix. 
um, in both of these plots, uh, the uncertainties are displayed as a percentage of the data. And then we've got the deweighted case on the top panel and the shifted case on the bottom panel. And we're basically interested in going from purple to blue because this corresponds to adding the nuclear, uh, nuclear covariance matrix to the existing experimental uncertainties. Um, so for the, the deweighted case, it's, it's quite clear that the heavy nuclear uncertainties are comparable to experimental uncertainties. And they're larger in most regions other than for this chorus antineutrino data. Uh, and this suggests that all the other data sets will be significantly de-weighted in the fit. But for the shifted case, we see that there's actually a marked decrease in the nuclear uncertainties from de-weighted to shifted. Um, so that for chorus, they're no longer significant. And that kind of ties in with what we saw uh, in the last slide where um, chorus showed quite a shift from, from the ratio of one. Um, so now let's turn to the uncertainties from the deuteron data. Um, Yes, yeah, so the, the logic is basically exactly the same here, but we've got a lot more deuteron data than heavy nuclear data from one element. So it allows us to fit our own deuteron PDFs within the standard NMPDF methodology. And that will lead us to next to next leading order PDFs rather than just next to leading order ones um, for calculating uncertainties. Um, so it's worth mentioning that the deuteron data come in two types. So some of them only involve deuteron targets and that's these uh, Slack and BCDMS. And the others are a ratio data, so the ratio of deuteron to proton observables. Um, and also normally in proton PDF bits, we basically predict any deuteron observable using the isoscalar PDF, which is FS here. And this is the average of proton and neutron PDFs, um, where we get the neutron PDF by swapping up and down quarks in the proton PDF. Um, and because we're actually determining the deuteron PDF from the data, in the proton PDF bits, we developed an iterative procedure for doing this, and the full method can be found in this paper here. Um, but as in the case for heavy nuclear data, it's useful to look at the change in observables um, when you use deuteron PDFs uh, rather than the isoscalar ones in this case. Uh, so yeah, th this time the uncertainties are quite large, um, but the ratio of observables is consistent with one in most regions, um, other than uh, some of this uh, mid high X region. Um, and this mi mirrors what we saw in the nuclear, the heavy nuclear case. Um, however, the overall uncertainties here are, are much smaller. Maybe they're sort of a few percent rather than 10 to 20 percent. Um, and again, here are the per point uncertainties. So we've only got the deweighted case here because the shifted case looks very, very similar. Um, but again, uh, we see what we saw in the heavy nuclear case. Um, the deuteron uncertainty is smaller than the experimental uncertainty for the slack, the slack and BCDMS, um, but for the ratio data, um, it's actually sort of comparable, and that's because um, the experimental uncertainties for the ratio to data are much smaller because of the cancellation of systematic errors in the numerator and the denominator. Um, okay, so so now we can just move on to the actual PDFs. Um, the um, NMPDF 4.0 release uh, includes de-weighted nuclear uncertainties for all nuclear data by default. So this is a baseline for comparison. Um, and then all the bits in this table were carried out using this 4.0 methodology. And basically, we considered both de-weighted and shifted prescriptions, and then both deuteron and heavy nuclear uncertainties separately and together. And we just looked at every combination. Um, so uh, We've got on this slide, I've got the chi squares for the various bits that we just looked at. Um, so these are plots um, of the chi squared for some of the deuteron data sets and then the total chi squared. Um, and then on the, on the left hand side, we're comparing having the deweighted versus the shifted case versus the no nuclear case. And then on the right, two, it's comparing shifted versus deweighted for heavy nuclear and deuteron separately. Um, and overall, basically, including the uncertainties causes the chi square to drop from 1.26 to 1.17. So that's um, quite an improvement. Um, but you know, we have, that's to be expected because we've added an uncertainty into the fit. Um, and the 4.0 baseline gives the best bit, which is dominated by the inclusion of heavy nuclear uncertainties without a shift. Uh, and you can see that the, the difference between de-weighted and shifted procedures is, is not very much, really. Um, okay, and then we can move on to the PDFs themselves. 
uh, nuclear uncertainties have an effect which is important in the mid to large X region where the nuclear data is. Um, and we'd like to know what impact adding nuclear uncertainties has on the PDFs firstly. Uh, so we can see that uh, adding um, nuclear uncertainties causes a significant change to the shape of the PDFs in the large X region. So you know, you're going from the orange one to the, the blue and the green. Um, and this corresponds to the nuclear shadowing region where the nuclear PDFs are lower compared to proton ones. So it seems like having no nuclear uncertainties causes the PDFs to be pulled downwards in this region in the direction of the nuclear PDFs. Um, and then uh, also displayed in the plot is the bit with only heavy nuclear uncertainties, which is the blue one. Um, and it's clear that the heavy nuclear uncertainties are responsible for the bulk of the impact, um, which was what we'd expect given that at the data level, the impact is much more significant for these data, which is what we saw previously. Um, and now uh, we can look at what happens when uh, we apply also a shift to the nuclear data. So overall, um, what we can see is the shifted one is the blue one here. Um, and the uh, orange one is uh, the deweighted one. And essentially there's little difference between shifting and applying a shift, especially for the deuteron uncertainties on this bottom plot. Um, it's more pronounced for the heavy nuclear case, but they, they agree within uncertainties. Um, and given that, uh, and the fact that the deweighting leads to a slightly better chi-squared and is also maybe um, a less uh, complicated procedure, we opted for the deweighted approach in 4.0. Uh, yeah. So in summary, um, Nuclear data are important in PDF bits, but uh, the effects due to the nuclear environment can be hard to um, precisely quantify. Um, and to, to bring PDFs um, towards 1% accuracy, we need to address these small but nevertheless important differences. So what we did was use the theory covariance matrix formalism, which we previously developed in NMPDF, to include these theory uncertainties in the next generation uh, NMPDF bits. And we adopted an empirical approach by recalculating predictions for nuclear observables with nuclear PDFs and then using the shifts in the predictions to construct a nuclear covariance matrix. And uh, we analyzed deuteron and heavy nuclear data separately and used NNPDF, NNNPDF 2.0 for heavy nuclear PDFs and fitting, uh, we fitted deuteron PDFs using an iterative procedure. Um, and the resulting uncertainties will be a very important ingredient in uh, NMPDF 4.0, um, which will be driven by the uncertainty on the heavy nuclear data um, being included. Yeah. So that's everything. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Rosalind, for a nice talk. Um, we have three questions. So, Petia, could you please start? Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would actually have multiple que questions, but uh, starting with one. Uh, so in NNPDF 2.0, the nuclear PDFs are fitted using the uh, chorus and uh, and other uh, other uh, nu uh, sorry other uh, other uh, neutrino nucleus data so uh, now you are using the same data to fit the proton pdfs um, am i missing something here or are you using the uh, same da data twice um it, it it can seem at first sight like it's double counting but it's actually not because um we're not using the same data uh twice in that sense that what, what we're using them here to do is just to estimate the size of uncertainty. And then we're just including that as an uncertainty in the uh, bit. So it's just telling us what the, the size of uncertainty is. Um, so it's not like we're using the data twice um, in that sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, if I'm allowed to a quick uh, continuation question. <laughs> Uh, do do you have a comparison with a bit where you would exclude the nuclear data, the heavy nuclear data altogether? This would be very interesting to see. Uh, yeah, we, we do have that, but I don't have it at the moment. I, can't, I haven't got access to it right now, but I could send it along to you. I think we have it if you're interested. OK, thank you. But yeah, the, the, uh, the outcome of that is that essentially the errors on the PDF are very large um, compared to what we're seeing here. So excluding the heavy nuclear data really does reduce the the quality of the the, the fit a lot um yeah Pavel? 
Yeah, th thank you, Rosalind. Um, so I was wondering um, whether you uh, could extract a nuclear correction as a function of X that could be directly compared to the nuclear correction either from the nuclear PDFs or from the nuclear models and uh, say something about the agreement between these two approaches. Um, we actually did that in our um, paper, which is um, this one um, here. Um, I don't have the plot with me right now, but it's in that paper. Uh, and we compared it to the MMHT nuclear correction model, nuclear correction, and they uh, agreed with each other quite well. Okay. Um, so I would... And the same for the deuteron, of course, can be done as well, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. We did that for the deuteron correction, not for heavy nuclear, yet, uh -huh. um, but we could do that. Okay, thank you. And uh, Robert, you had a question? Yeah, um, you partially answered my question after I put my hand up, but I'll still ask it anyway because <laughs> uh, it didn't completely answer. So I, I'm intrigued as to why you use the de-weighting rather than the shifted as the default. Now, you did give some reasons, but wouldn't you expect uh, the shifted to be a better determination of the central value than the de-weighting? Yeah, I mean... Personally, I think, it, well, it was, we had a discussion about it in NMPDF. I, I think maybe I would have preferred to use the deweighted one personally, because for that reason that you're, especially given the chorus data uh, here with this. You, this you mean the shifted? Yeah, exactly. But um, I think in the end, just because the, the, the shifted procedure is maybe a more aggressive procedure um, it, in the sense that you are, changing the, the predictions, um, we thought that we would include it using a more conservative approach, the de-weighted approach, which is more conservative, um, at least for the time being. But I think we will, uh, I think we will release a version with the shifted um, procedure included as well. Um, I think yeah. I just offer the op opposite point of view. I think it's more aggressive to use the de-weighting because you're making the strong assumption that the most likely effect is that there is no correction. Yeah, um, no, I think it's a good point. Um, I think that's just what was decided on in the end um, because some people weren't happy with the idea of shifting the central value, but I don't know if um, if Manuele has a, another perspective on it or not, but I think I thought it was just a sort of a decision that it seemed less aggressive in that sense. Well, um, yeah. If I can make a comment, I we would say that the nuclear correction is basically compatible with one, except perhaps for chorus neutrino, as shown, for example, in this plot and in the corresponding plot for the deuterium. So, so that's basically that so that's one. basically the reason why the majority of the <clears throat> NNPDF members prefer the deweighted approach in comparison to the shifted approach, exactly because, well, if you wonder, there might be a sociological bias here, where the premise is to expect that the nuclear correction is anyways compatible with one. Okay, thanks. It's interesting to hear it's a majority rather than unanimous verdict anyway. Yeah, it was definitely something we discussed and I think that's what we settled on in the end, but I think there's arguments either way. Um, and yeah, per personally, I, I prefer the shifted um, one. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Rosalind. Uh, so we move to our next speaker, Xiao Xian. Could you please share your slides? Hi, can you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Xiao Xianjin. I'm from Southern Methodist State University. Currently, I'm a PhD student here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the digital scary experiments in the CTEC JLab and CTEC P Global QCD analysis. Uh, this is the work done with a virtual Cardi from the um, uh, JLab and uh, Team Hubs and uh, Pavel Nadowski from the SMU. Uh, in, this, sorry. in this research, I studied the impact of digital DRS data on CJ and CT next in the order fits uh, in a few uh, variations. The first one, it is without uh, digital corrections with no DC. 
on SP abbreviation aren't the with fixed Deuteron corrections, fixed DC, with free Deuteron corrections, the free DC, and without certain experiments such as uh, no new A DIS or uh, slack DIS and uh, W repeated asymmetry. Uh, in addition, I compared the CJ and CT PDF bits on the same fitting using the L2 sensitivity method. So, uh, um, the detailed uh, study can be found uh, on in this link of archive. We know that uh, for a PDF fitting, we adopt uh, certain parameterization and fit lots of experiments to get the final PDF uh, functions. For example, in the CT18 PDF, uh, a different groups of experiments such as the inclusive jets, WZ production, pair DIS, and fixed target DIS adrenaline experiments are included. And the CT next next in your analysis, it also indicates that the D, U, Gluon, and other flavors at X larger than 0.3, they receive strong constraints from the fixed target Deuteron DIS data. In addition, because we have the thumb rule, the constraints they also affect the PDFs at low X. At such as uh, from 0.01 to 0.05. So let's look at the LHC uh, precision experiments. So LHC precision experiments they are uh, they are strongly uh, dependent on certain PDF values. And in this plot, we see that the correlation between the weak mixing angle uh, it is strongly correlated to the U valence and D valence at the region of 0.01 and 0.05. We can see that. At this region, the correlation it is essentially a, a, a proxy 0.7, so they are strongly correlated. So we wish to understand like which experiments they have the fixed contribution or the biggest constraint on this uh, on the U valence and D valence. Here in this plot, it is a uh, plot by the uh, by the Lagrangian multiply method. We can see that these two curves, the these two curve which is the BC and AMS deuteron and the AMC ratio. They are, they are the two experiments most affect the uh, D balance at, uh, at X point equal to 0 0.03 at, uh, at its 5 GV. So these two experiments, they are the Deuteron DIS experiments. And uh, in the CT, it contains these two experiments. And in CJ, it contains other Deuteron experiments such as the bonus data, select, De uh, select Deuteron, JLab Deuteron, and Hermos De Deuteron. So intermediate and large X region of the DIS deuteron uh, data, they are affected by nuclear dynamics um, in particular. Also due to the uh, degelapped evolution and uh, the thumb rule, they will also affect other flavors. In the CJ, it implements a detailed model of the nuclear uh, effect at next, next, uh, ne at next leading order. And you see it here, it does, uh, the default CT does not have uh, uh, implementation of the nuclear effects due to the its high W cuts, which make it, which makes the uh, its data not so sensitive to the um, region that is dominated by one over Q squared. So CT uh, implements the next linear next next linear contribution and a larger data set. Here, well, let's talk about the uh, Deuteron correction the theory about it. So isoscalar uh, isoscalar approximation to the Deuteron PDF. FD, it is modeled based on the Proulon PDF FP. In addition, to uh, the complete treatment of the Deuteron correction must include a few aspects. The first one is the uh, virtuality of the struck uh, bound nucleon, uh, as known as the uh, uh, optionis, also the relative Fermi motion and the nuclear wave function. All these three aspects they are being implemented in the CJ PDFs. In the CJ PDFs, the implementation it is treated as a convolution of the bonded nuclear proton distribution and the nucleonic uh, smearing function, as shown in this formula. It is the convolution of these two um, parts. The first part, the bonded nucleon part distribution, uh, it consists of the PDF of the free onshear nucleon and also the offshore e effect. So offshore effect is what we are trying to fit here. Uh, we fit the offshore function. So offshore function is a third order polynomial. Uh, look like this. It has three parameters, the coefficient x0 and x1. Uh, we'll, uh, in the CJ, we assume that is uh, energy independent and it also uh, satisfies the quark number sum rule. And in CT, as we just mentioned, uh, the default CT did not have the uh, Deuteron correction implemented. 
uh, and uh, a, vari uh, a variation of CT, which is a fixed DC, uh, we are using in this research. It adopts a fixed deuteron correction. And in this plot, this plot shows the dynamic nuclear correction. We see that at the high X region, there is a small dependence of the uh, deuteron correction to the energy scale. Here in this plot, the uh, uh, solid curves, they are the, uh, they represent the CT and the dashed curves, they represent the CJ. Next, uh, we wish to uh, compare them between them. How do we know that there are lots of difference between the CJ and CT fields. How can we make them as similar as possible? So we made the following changes so we can enable the comparisons. First of all, so the default CT use the next next linear order. In this research, we fix CT to the next linear order. Also, CT originally used a tier one plus tier two penalty. Tier one, uh, here we only use a tier one penalty. In short, the tier one plus tier two penalty, uh, the tier one penalty, it is uh, we regulate the uh, behavior along each eigendirection of the total chi square of all experiments. And the tier two penalty, it also goes to the chi square of each experiment to make sure it does not exceed a certain level. Uh, exceed a certain level. Uh, we also apply a fixed deuteron correction to the CT. In the CJ, it uses the default next linear order, and uh, CJ also have a problem with the icon directions. We use uh, uh, adjustment to uh, adjust the non-Gaussian directions, uh, which is similar, to, which is equivalent to the tier one penalty in the CT. Eventually, uh, CT, uh, CJ, uh, CJ can also apply a free or fixed deuteron corrections. We generate the Hessian PDF test both for both PDF feeds and uh, for T square equal to T and compare the chi square plus for the large groups of experiments. So here in this table, I'm going to show the different feeds in CJ and the CT we performed. So for example, the first one is the CJ with no DC and CJ with fixed DC. And CT, no DC, CT with fixed DC. We group the experiments into these 11 groups, the gamma jet, jet tevatron, DIS proton, DIS deuteron, WZ tevatron, WZ LHC, and so on. And we quickly realize that there are certain experiments that only exist in one, uh, certain types of experiments that only exist in one PDF bit and do not exist in the other one. So we exclude such kinds of experiments and obtain two other PDF bits, which is the CJ, no W, no slack, and the um, CT, no new A data. Now let's look at the chi-square of each fit. We can see that between the CJ no deuteron correction and with fixed deuteron correction, there's a big change of the total chi-square here. Uh, the chi-square increased approximately 200, more than 200 units. The so major um, experiments that contribute this, to this chi-square change is the DIS deuteron as expected because the CDS deuteron, uh, it is obviously affected by deuteron correction. And in addition, we found that the WZ Tevatron data is also the chi-square also increased by a, a significant amount. While in CT, the case is slightly different. The total change of the chi-square done is not changed that much. And the DIS data, uh, the DIS deuteron data, the chi-square didn't change much, but there is a change in the WZ LHC. The, chi-square reduced, and for the dryland data, the chi-square in increased. So this tells us that although the uh, deuteron correction does not affect this experiment directly, but because of the PDF fitting and the uh, decalapped evolution function, uh, evolution equation, and the sum rules, it will also affect other experiments. And uh, here in this plot, uh, we can see that this is a D over U PDF um, plot for the or the fits we performed, we can see that the inclusion of the deuteron correction it affects the deuteron review at large x regions. We can see here, and it also have a consequence for the small x region due to the valence sum rule. Here we can see there is a change at small x. Similarly, uh, there is also change to the gluon data uh, to the gluon PDF. This is also because of the decalapped evolution. So we see that there's clearly impact of the deuteron corrections to the final fit. And uh, it is very significant. And we know that it changes the chi-square of each experiment. But how do we know that, how does, how does the 
uh, how can we isolate the pools of various experiments on PDF in this complicated global analysis, uh, PDF seat bit? We apply the Hessian sensitivity method. Uh, the Hessian so here's a, a introduction to the L2 sensitivity. L2 sensitivity, it is a linear approximation for the delta chi square over 30 experiment E when some PDF value FAXQ at certain XQ grid increased by a uh, 68% confidence level of the hashing PDF uncertainty. It's defined as two vectors, the cosine of two vectors and the norm of the first vector. The vectors are defined along each eigendirection. Along each eigendirection, we can define one element of this um, vector, which is the chi-square of the po point of direction minus, minus direction. Uh, the sensitivity method of the sensitivity is very fast to calculate and comparing to the Lagrangian multiplier method, it is also have good accuracy. Let's understand the correlation and or the LT sensitivity method a little bit more. Uh, in the PDF parameter space, so when we define the a change of the total chi-square by certain units, it actually defines a hyper ellipsoid and uh, the Principal matrices of this hyper ellipsoid are the eigen directions, eigen vector directions. Now, if we shrink the eigen directions into the same length, uh, uh, the principal axis into the same length, we will obtain a hypersphere. Now, the correlation it will measure the cosine of the angle between two, the gradient of two quantities x and y in this adjusted PDF parameter space. And the sensitivity, it is the projection of the x gradient onto y's, y's gradient in this adjusted PDF parameter space. Now that we understand the LT sensitivity, we can see uh, actual LT sensitivity plot. Here it is uh, LT sensitivity. So first of all, we see that if there are certain groups of experiments and uh, it's um, sensitivity to the D over U flavor. So it uh, shows the sensitivity along uh, at all x um, values at 2 GV. And the negative value means that if we uh, change the D over U to a negative value, it will correspond to a smaller chi-square, which means the negative value will prefer the smaller PDF value at this x um, location. Now let's look at the comparison of the CJ with no DC and a fixed DC. One thing we notice that is that um, with no DC, so there is a strong pull against each other between the experiment group one, the gamma jet, and the experiment group four, the ice neutron. The pool is very large, about 30 uh, units compared to other experiments at other regions. And we can also see that the effect, uh, the effect, uh, the neutron correction not only affects the uh, uh, DS neutron data, it also affects other experiments because we can see the curve of other experiments groups changes. From these two plots, we can conclude that the nuclear correction, it reduces the compelling L2 pools at large X here, and it will lead to the reduction of the air band as shown in this plot. And that is what we found in CJ. So how about CT case? In the CT case, we found that so change, there is some change in the pools of all the experiments, but there's no significant reduction of the pools. So the nuclear correction in the CT case did not reduce the tension that much, but it has to have some impact of the some certain experiments, such as the DDI tutorial. This is ex as expected. Next, I'm going to show the uh, sensitivity of the, to the gluon for the CJ with free DC and uh, with fixed DC. For the free DC, we introduce uh, uh, to the easiest way to understand the free DC is that we expand the uh, PDF parameter space to the to two more di uh, a few more dimensions, which correspond to the free nuclear correction parameters. And we found that when we have the free DC, the experiments agree with each other very well. And in the CT case, we well, because we can only use the fixed DC, there are still some uh, some pools between the experiment groups. Uh, finally, I'm going to summarize my talk. Uh, so PDF sensitivity, it is a statistical indicator that quantizes the constraints from the experiments on PDFs in the CTAC global PDF fit. So sensitivity method is applied 
uh, to understand the origin of these pools of the DORU, GLOM, and other flavors in the CJ and CQ bits. The pools are affected by nuclear corrections in the fixed target DIS and non parameters. The treatment of the nuclear effects in the large X in the PDF bits affects the PDF uncertainty in the RHC electro weak precision measurements and the dual corrections while comparable to the uncertainties in the modern next next neural fits and will play a more important role in the future. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Shen. Do we have questions? I see no hands up. All right. If we have no questions for our speaker, uh, thank you again. And we move on to our next speaker, Petya Pakinen, who will show the latest update of EPPS 21. Okay, thanks. I will begin sharing. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, very good. So thanks. Uh, today I will be talking about our work towards the next EPPS uh, set of nuclear PDFs. And this work is done in collaboration with Kari Eskola, Hannu Palkkunen and Carlos Salgado. And I will begin with a just a short introduction to our framework. So we define the nuclear PDFs in terms of the bound proton PDFs, which we obtain from the free proton PDFs by multiplying them with the nuclear modification, modification factor. And the uh, PDFs of full nuclei can then be constructed from these uh, by assuming the isospin symmetry between the bound neutron and bound proton uh, PDFs. Uh, what we do is that we parameterize the nuclear modification factors uh, in X in terms of the location and the height of the EMC minimum and the uh, anti-shadowing maximum and by the amount of small X shadowing. And in A dependence, we use a power law uh, type uh, function. Uh, but currently we are still exploring the best fit functions for our next EPPS fit. Uh, this fit is, of course, uh, motivated by the uh, good amount of new data that are available to us. So from DIS, we have the new JLab data where we are now including uh, data from the class collaboration. Then from LHC, we have traded the uh, older uh, forward to backward ratios of digit production with the newer uh, RP-LED measurements. And we are now including also the D0 measurements from uh, LHCB, and we have also W measurements from uh, RUN2. Uh, some details of the analysis are still preliminary, and there might be uh, slight changes here. Um, one thing that we pay co close attention to in our analysis is the role of the free proton PDF uncertainties. So, for example, here showing uh, this for the W production in proton lead at 8.16 TV. Uh, in case of uh, CT14 uncertainties, we see that these are can be large and even exceed those from the nuclear modifications. So, uh, it, the nuclear uh, free proton PDFs uncertainties uh, certainly should not be neglected when fitting the N PDFs. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, wherever possible we use the nuclear modification ratios of the data to uh, cancel the free proton PDF uncertainty in our fits. And for example here you can see that in, in case of the uh, W's uh, when we use a mixed energy nuclear modification take, uh, ratio, so uh, taking a ratio of the proton lead data at 8.16 TeV with the proton proton data at 8.0 TeV, we have a very good cancellation of the free proton uncertainty. Uh, some baseline proton PDF uncertainty can still remain in the, in the nuclear uh, modification fits. And as a new element in our analysis, we study the uh, role of these uh, baseline variations by fitting the nuclear modification separately for each of the CT18A error sets. So how this works is that, uh, as usual, we take the CT18A central set uh, and fit the nuclear modifications uh, using that. 
proton PDF set, which, uh, which then gives the, our central set of the nuclear modifications. And we uh, varied the, or studied the variations of the chi-squared uh, profile around the found uh, minimum and performed the Hessian error analysis, which then gives us the usual nuclear error sets which can be uh, used to uh, calculate the traditional nuclear errors. Uh, but now on top of that, as I said, we take all the CT18A error sets and fit the nuclear modifications for each of them, which uh, gives then us uh, error sets of the baseline variations. And then just using the standard uh, Hessian uh, error propagation, we can calculate the baseline uncertainty and by combining this with the uh, nuclear modification uncertainties, we get the full error of our analysis. Uh, what we find is that the uh, baseline uncertainty is subdominant in most of the observables that we fit, but for example, here in the case of the fixed target trillion data, uh, they show up. Then moving to the new data that we include, here are the JLab uh, class collaboration data on the neutral current DIS, and we get a very good fit uh, with the results uh, in line with the rewaking study performed by Paukunen and Surita. And uh, we take into account here the leading target mass corrections, and uh, we find that uh, we find no need to include any isospin dependence in our and nuclear modifications of the bound protons, as uh, uh, some, some EMC effect models might suggest. Uh, then moving to LHC uh, and the digit at uh, 5 TB, we again get a very good fit uh, and a strong uh, a reduction in our nuclear PDF uncertainties, and the results are again in line with a uh, reweighting study that we have performed earlier. Uh, as in there, we again find uh, uh, difficulty in fitting the forwardmost data points. And since the origin of this discrepancy is not yet known to us, they are currently excluded from the fit. Uh, but this does not play a strong role in the, in the final results. Uh, then moving to uh, D zeros, uh, we get a good fit both in the backward uh, direction with the bins shown here and in the forward forward bins and the results again are in line with a uh, separate reweighting study and here we use the NLO uh, simplified ACAT uh, MT scheme uh, devised by Helenius and Paukunen and also, also we use a PT cut of 3 GV to reduce theoretical uncertainties that might be relevant in the uh, small PT range. Then, as I said, we include the Ws with this uh, mixed energy nuclear modification ratio, again getting a very good fit, and we find that these data are fully consistent with the other constraints from the digits and D0s, which is an uh, important check on the NPD of universality and factorization. However, we do not seem to get very strong additional flavor separation constraints uh, uh, on top of those that we had already in EPPS16, which, which is uh, rather unfortunate. And here we are looking forward to increased precision at LHC run 3, which might help, help in this sense. Uh, then to the fit results. So here on the left hand side, I'm showing the modifications at the bound proton level, which is what we fit. And on the right hand side, uh, the modifications at the full nucleus uh, level, which uh, are more closely related to what is seen in the observables. So here are showing the UV and DV uh, valence box. What we find is that the uh, uncertainties at the bound proton level are quite large, uh, but they are strongly anti-correlated. So when we combine them to the full nucleus level, um, much of the uncertainty cancels. Uh, the same happens also when we go to the C, but the uh, uh, cancellation is not, not as strong and some uh, large uncertainties can remain. And here we also see that the baseline variations start to play a more significant role. And this all just is related to the uh, difficulty in, in fitting the 
flavor separation. Uh, and the same same thing is seen also for the strange squawk, which which is the least constrained uh, flavor in our fit at the moment. And also we see uh, that the uh, baseline uncertainty is uh, play some role in the in the small uh, nuclei gluons, where we also have uh, rather limited uh, data constraints. But on the other hand, uh, the gluons at the, in lead are now much better constrained than uh, comparing here to our earlier EPPS16 fit. Uh, we uh, both at the anti-shadowing and in the uh, shadowing region and for the first time in a global fit of nuclear PDFs, we uh, have the uh, uncertainty is at mid X region to sub 10% level at the 10 GB squared scale, which I find rather significant. Uh, but as I said, the flavor separation and especially strangeness uh, remains to be a, a difficult uh, aspect to constrain with the data that we have, have at the moment. So as a final thing, just a quick comparison with the NNMPDF 2.0 and NCTEC 15 WC uh, nuclear PDFs. So all three are consistent within, within the uncertainties, but there are uh, large differences in the uncertainty estimates and the central uh, results as well uh, due to differences in the methodology and in the included data. And again, I would like to point out the, uh, the gluons in our uh, new global analysis, which uh, really stand apart, apart from any earlier fit uh, due to the new constraints from the LHC data. So summarizing uh, the new EPPS NPDF fit is on its way. And we have obtained a good fit of uh, multiple new nuclear data, both from LHC and JLA. Uh, and we find a strong new constraints on the gluon modification in lead with uh, sub 10% level uh, uncertainties at the mid, mid X region. Uh, on the other hand, we still find the uh, flavor separations of, of, of to be rather hard to constrain, especially for the C quarks. And uh, as a new element of our study, we have uh, charted the baseline free proton PDF uncertainties in our fit. And uh, I would like to highlight that we use the data as nuclear modification ratios to uh, decorrelate the nuclear modification and free proton PDFs uh, to best possible extent. But still, some residual baseline free proton PDFs, PDF uncertainties can remain, especially in the flavor combinations where we have uh, limited uh, data constraints. And these affect uh, in, uh, mostly the C quark flavor separation and the light nuclei gluons. And we are still charting the possible parameterization choices, but I think we are uh, converging towards a final fit. So stay tuned. And Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Petia, for a nice talk and for being super well on time because now we have time for questions. So the first one to raise the hand was Raba. So please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi, Petia. Very nice talk. Um, my questions are related to slides, uh, slide seven, mainly digit uh, data. Yes. yes. Um, so three questions. First, what chi-square do you get in total for all these uh, PT bins? That's one. Two, um, you highlight only one point, uh, the extreme positive rapidity, but yet you sometimes also miss the, the prior one, right? Uh, at, at almost two. Um, so this, this should have a huge also contribution to your chi-square. And three, have you tried to fit the absolute spectrum that, that uh, not, not a ratio, just PPB? And what have you found? Thank you. Okay, so uh, if we exclude only the highlighted data points, then uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but, but the uh, chi-squared uh, per data point is uh, some, but 
I think bit about one, but not uh, very significantly. Uh, again, I don't remember exact values. Uh, however, when when the final data points would be in included, this would uh, increase the chi squared by thirty units. So this is very significant. And and no, we have not tried to fit the uh, fit the spectra directly uh, exactly for the reason that we try to cancel the free proton PDFs uh, as much as we can. So this is our fitting strategy strategy here so and we uh, what we have seen in, in this analysis is that the, that the free proton pdfs uh, play a very significant role in in the spectra so this is the reason that we have not fitted them did i answer all your questions yeah yeah very good thank you miguel yes can you go to the previous slide please slide six so here, so you say that there is no sign of isosp independence on the bound proton modification. And uh, my question is, um, do you know what is the expectation from models of the EMC effect? So do you have sensitivity to, to, to either uh, confirm or, or uh, rule out certain scenarios? Do you, do you, do you, can you put limits on that? Is, is it possible? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, uh, I, this would be an interesting aspect to study. Uh, there are differences among the EMC effect uh, models, and some of them are claiming that there should be some isospin dependence. But uh, I'm not an expert on, on the models, and, uh, but this would be very interesting to study that uh, whether we can, based on a, this kind of a global analysis, uh, put some uh, limits on, on the models. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting because here you see data is very precise, your extraction is very accurate, and uh, there are plenty of uh, um, targets. So I think that would be interesting. So that, that's it. Thank you. And then we have Fred. Yeah, so very nice. It was interesting to see the uh, uh, comparison with the OHCB D0. Um, quick question on that. Uh, I assume the uh, charm is from Gwen radiation. There's no fitted charm. And what was the mass value? And did you play with uh, play with varying the charm mass at all? Uh, no, we didn't play with the uh, uh, charm mass. So it's taken as uh, 1.3 GeV. And uh, yes, it's uh, the charm is purely uh, perturbative. Okay, yeah, it seems to fit very nicely. So thank you. Yeah. Happen? Yes, hi. I, can you go to slide 12, please? So uh, if we focus on uh, the D valence, uh, but, so you see this very interesting pinch point that acts about 0 0.005, which uh, is not in the other group, uh, parameterizations of the other groups, but also you see this point is very pronounced in other uh, figures. What, what causes that? So, sorry. Uh, oh, the, there is a pin, it's very small uncertainty at x equal to 0 0.05. Yeah, right here. In the right other groups here. don't okay. have it, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, partly a, a, a parameterization bias. Uh, so, so the small x region is not so relevant for the for the valence quarks or or at the uh, data that we currently have we cannot uh, fit fit the small x region very precisely so so currently our uh, our parameterization of the valence quarks at small x is not uh, very flexible and uh -huh. by allowing more freedom would just uh, uh, Increase the answer that is of, of course, but uh, could uh, uh, make okay. a, a, fit, a fit poorly convergent. So, so uh -huh. this is partly a parameterization bias at the, at the okay. moment, and it okay. would be nice to have data that would, uh, with which we could improve the situation. Yeah, I understand. Okay, well, good, good. I, I was just curious if it is some physical effect. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Can we move to the last question, Alexis? Uh, very nice talk, Petya. Um, I saw there's uh, three additional um, uh, parameters in the new APPS uh, set. 
uh, what are these parameters or like what, what is it trying to parameterize? Is any of it is trying to improve a dependence? Yes, uh, in particular, uh, we have opened uh, uh, the parameterization of the A dependence of the anti-shadowing, amount of anti-shadowing. Uh, and this is now something that we can, can to some extent uh, uh, fit. Uh, still, there are uh, large uncertainties related to that aspect, as we don't have very good uncertainties for the smaller nuclei. Uh, there are other parameters also, uh, also one parameter uh, uh, reflecting the, uh, the start of the, of the shadowing in the, in the gluons and, and then in the C, C sector we have one, one parameter and so on. So yes, especially at this parameter reflecting the reflecting the anti-shadowing of the of the gluons, the A dependence is now more flexible than what we have had in the previous uh, EPPS sixteen analysis. Thank you, Miguel. Do you still have a question, or is just your hand up? Ah, uh, sorry, no. No problem. So uh, thank you very much, Petia. And we move to the next speaker, which is Baba, who will talk us about the NNN PDF 3.0. Thank you. Um, do you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, so perfectly after Petia, I'll talk about the uh, N and NPDF 3.0 uh, global analysis of nuclear PDF using neural networks. And um, I've slightly modified the title. It was just N and NPDF 3.0. Now it's towards because the, the, the work uh, wasn't done. Um, and yeah, okay. So this, this work is, uh, is uh, with collaboration with my supervisor, Juan Rojo, Emanuele, uh, who's here, Nachera, and um, Jake, um, Jake Ether, uh, Tommaso Gianni as well. Okay, the outline. So I'll be just reminding you a bit of the, um, of the NNPDF 2.0 uh, parameterization and constraints we use based on this paper. Um, then I'll talk a bit um, about the progress we've done uh, to achieve or the planned 3.0. Uh, uh, mainly I'll be talking about uh, CMS5 uh, TV digits, which Pitya nicely also um, uh, showed. And uh, I think there's an, this is an interesting data set to discuss. Then I'll talk a bit about the progress we've done uh, calculating Drillian at NMLO, as this is one of the main thing we, we're planning to do. And on Thursday, there will be a talk also on the impact of electron ion collider on both nuclear and proton PDF. Okay, so um, this is already went through by Pitya, but I'll just mention a bit uh, the three point nod, what we'll try to include. So um, in two point nod, we included all uh, available neutral current DIS and uh, charge current DIS, mainly new Tev and chorus. And as well, um, we tried to, inc we, we included uh, W and Z production at both five and eight TeV. So these were mainly the, 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 the data sets and we, we, okay, we have a Monte Carlo approach. I'll, I'll explain in a bit. Uh, we use NNPDF 3.1 as a proton baseline. I also explain how, how this is happening. And uh, neural networks is the main uh, parameterization of, of our uh, nuclear PDFs. So in 3.0, what we will do is focus on uh, NNLO for, um, for the data sets that we already included. So for DIS, it's already uh, very easy to, to compute uh, next to next linear order coefficient functions. But for Drellian, this is, uh, of course, as you know, slightly more uh, convoluted. So um, as a first attempt, we will uh, fit uh, the Drellian via K factors, which I'll explain the procedure as well. Um, so no direct fit, uh, meaning uh, convoluting uh, partonic resection, the GLAP and PDFs. It's, it's via an approximation called K factors. 
Um, and there is an attempt by Tommaso as well to, to include the D0 production from the LHC. So, um, okay. Regarding methodology, nothing really will change in three point notes. So it's mainly uh, QCD corrections and um, data sets. Okay, a review on uh, two point notes. So what we use, of course, is a neural network. Um, this architecture has been fixed between one point node and two point node. So we use three inputs for the neural network uh, the Bjorken X logarithm of it and uh, the atomic mass A. And then um, we have an intermediate uh, 25 nodes and finally uh, the, the flavors that we fit. So in two point node, there was six independent flavors. So that uh, covers all the light quarks and gluon um, setting S equal to S bar. Um, as you can see here that, so aside the neural network, there's a, like um, uh, three factors that control the large X and the low X behavior. So uh, we impose that uh, the PDF, of course, go to zero at x equal one, and also we impose the um, some 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 correction or some uh, controlling on the small x behavior via these alpha. Um, then we impose some rules when whenever they're uh, they, they they're available, and then um, of course we combine. Um, so we fit mainly proton bound proton. And then we combine them uh, via isospin symmetry to form the actual nuclear PDF. Okay, um, so the constraints we impose. So how do we use proton PDF as a boundary condition or a constraint? So on the level of chi squared, which is you all know uh, written like that, right? With a T zero to avoid the D'Agostini bias. So on top of that, we add um, a Lagrange multiplier to control or to impose that Whenever A is equal to one, we reproduce exactly an MPDF 3.1 uh, replica by replica. So we, we correlate every replica from the proton uh, to the nuclear PDF uh, fit. And then we impose also a positivity constraint. So we, um, we kind of uh, have a pseudo data that uh, always has to be positive. And whenever it's not, the, the chi-square just explodes. Uh, that's how we control it. Um, then, of course, there's a sum rules that are um, just uh, the glue on the number sum rules that are explained here. These are all the constraints. And then uh, here I plot also to show you that uh, we can really reproduce the proton. Uh, so in, in blue, you see the uh, our fit to the proton, so the boundary condition. And in, 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 uh, in orange, you see the NNPDF 3.1. And we kind of reproduce exactly the the, the distribution. Okay, um, the results, just uh, just to scan on the results, I only show the charge current DIS and the Trillian, the, the W and Z productions. Uh, you can see that, um, so, uh, okay, this is the transition between fitting DIS only and hadronic data is uh, uh, highlighted quite nicely in this column. So we, we kind of fit nicely all the hadronic data and we end up with a very good uh, chi-squared and this is also uh, the chi-squared of EPPS16. Um, so we have compatible also like uh, ups and downs uh, which is nicely um, nicely consistent. Um, you can see in these plots uh, there's nothing um, nothing surprising. Uh, all, all, all data sets as highlighted by PTR are consistent within each other. And also you can see that nicely uh, how different the proton PDF. So this is the proton prediction. This is the size of nuclear effects basically. So you can see in, uh, in this ratio here where we plot uh, PPB over PP, the predictions. And you can see nicely the, the, this uh, suppression uh, at large uh, rapidity in, in uh, well, at low as well, but uh, mainly at, at uh, large rapidity. Um, okay, so, uh, Towards three point nod, uh, I'll be focusing mainly on on uh, the k factors uh, for W and Z. Mainly Z. This is what we what, what we've done so far. But I will also talk about the investigation we've done with uh, CMS uh, Digit. So let me start with CMS Digit. So um, this data set was uh, was provided for both PP and PPB. Uh, in the same kinematics, so basically the PP is shifted to match the center of mass frame of the of the uh, heavy ion collision. 
Um, and it was provided in, into two observables. One is the, uh, so this is the spectrum. So this is uh, either PP or PPB. Now I don't see, yeah, it's PP. Uh, as you can see, there's five bin of PT and uh, okay, the eta of the digit. And the other observable is the ratio of the spectrum. So the P led over PP uh, in, in terms of ratio. Uh, and this is what EPPS 16, uh, EPPS 21 fitted. Uh, we've attempted to fit both of these. Um, and uh, one particular like uh, characteristic of this data set is this very small uncertainties, which uh, really um, were surprising. And uh, that's mainly due to the observable uh, considered. So uh, this is uh, basically when you normalize by the total number of events, uh, this really reduces your uncertainties. And one more thing to, to, to mention about this data set is that is there's no uh, correlations included. Uh, a little bit of history, uh, a month ago, or no, a couple of months ago, we, we released a paper uh, on uh, fitting proton PDF with an NPDF uh, to digit and single jet data. We haven't included this data set for that reason. Um, but now, um, because we're considering it for nuclear PDF, we wanted to, 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 to investigate the PP the data first. And uh, there was some trouble. So when we uh, fit it at next to leading order, we always found this discrepancy at uh, the extreme uh, digit bin. So this is a fit to the absolute spectrum, uh, only PP data. This is on top of the digit that we fitted already, like seven and eight TV. Uh, seven and eight TV digits are already included and CMS five TV on top. Uh, and clearly one can see that there's an inconsistency either between the other data set and this one or the data set has some some problem right um so fitting all the bins we end up with the best chi squared in pp is 2.51 at next to leading order and we were provided also with um, with k factors uh but this only deteriorated the fit actually Okay, but with that, we, uh, we, we haven't cut any bin yet. So we take it as it is and we see the, the impact on PDFs. And you can see clearly that um, consistently with what we found in the paper that there's uh, quite an impact on the gluon, even though this fit uh, like is, a, is on top of the old digits, you, you might expect that there shouldn't be any modification, but there is. Um, so this is next to leading order and uh, the red is without and the blue is with. So this is the ratio uh, of with over without. You can see uh, quite some modifications here. Uh, okay, at an and the low, although the chi squared is very big, I wouldn't uh, really talk about this uh, on the right side. Okay, um, now we move to the uh, proton lead. Um, this is exactly the same ratio uh, Peter uh, showed. And um, there is some very common features. So you can see that this bin, one cannot really get to, right? So let me explain first. So uh, in red, you can see the two-point node. Uh, two-point node fits plus a proton baseline that included all the digits, right? So this is a upgraded two-point node. In blue, you can see the, the fit to absolute spectra only of proton lead and in green you see the ratio uh, the fit to the ratio which is the data that is is shown uh, of course the green seems the most um, uh, compatible with the data but uh, yeah we don't describe it well so we we uh, the best chi squared we found was 3.8 uh, which was of course not acceptable um, uh, yeah, and mainly, so yeah, mainly the problem is is uh, the extreme bins, but also we have some some issues uh, in in this bin of PT uh, that wasn't clear in in PT slides actually. So this this needs a bit more investigating. Um, fitting the absolute spectra only uh, produced the chi squared of six on the non-fitted ratio data and. Uh, almost compatible chi-squared if there's no uh, digit, digit fitted at all, no ratio, nor absolute spectrum, which is uh, also like this shows that the absolute is not 
also consistent with the, the ratio. So, I mean, there's something, there's some tension between these two. Um, nevertheless, like even with the, the bad chi squared, we look at the PDFs. Uh, so, this is the proton PDF, uh, which I showed earlier, basically, but um, this is from the point of view of the nuclear PDF. So, this is our boundary condition, basically. Um, so, you can see almost the same impact as the proton PDF, but What's interesting is when you when you look at lead, um, and this is what the, the interest uh, one. So when you fit uh, two point naught plus the ratio uh, p lead over pp, you see that in green um, the gluon is quite consistent with the two point naught uncertainty. So it it doesn't um, it doesn't have it's all consistent with the uncertainties. But when you move to the absolute spectrum, you find uh, slightly strange behavior, um, uh, which which um, which we, we also see if you zoom in into absolute uncertainties. Like there's something fishy about this. Um, okay, and to summarize, so these are the fit quality um, when we fit uh, PP, as I said. So without uh, any, um, uh, so this is basically without any digits, without the without the CNS five TV, we have six almost chi squared we include it we have 2.51 and then uh, at nnlo it's uh, really bad um then in the nuclear pdf case when we include uh, absolute spectrum we also have a bad chi squared uh, without it without the fit but then uh, it moves to 3.5 and when we fit the ratio we have 3.8 um, okay, um, I have one minute. So there's no tension actually recorded between the 5TV and the 7 and 8 in PP, which is also uh, an extra hint that there is something specific about this data set. Um, it doesn't bring new information. It's just maybe uh, the correlation missing are very important to, to be able to describe it. Um, and just a little word on the Drelian at NNLO. Um, so we're trying to include uh, next to next leading order corrections via K factors. What, what is a K factor? So we have the next to leading order uh, cross section, um, convolution of the next to leading order partonic cross section with your uh, proton and nuclear PDF. This is a uh, luminosity combining them both. And um, the K factor at NNLO is basically just the um, cross section at NNLO computed via both mat matrix element at NNLO and PDFs at NNLO over the matrix elements at NNLO uh, convoluted with NLO PDFs, right? Um, so the first thing we want to try, because this is really hard to include in Monte Carlo generators, we cannot really uh, so far found uh, a Monte Carlo generator that accepts uh, both proton and nuclear PDF. We are approximating it uh, by just taking proton-proton uh, PDF. So we're assuming that nuclear effects cancel in the, in the ratio of uh, K factors. Um, and yeah, finally, you just convolute this K factor with uh, the partonic resection and you end up with uh the cross section at nnlo and finally i'll end up with this so uh this is the first successful uh nnlo computation we've done with the cms z uh proton pro uh, proton led but this is a proton proton so uh you can see that we benchmark first matrix versus mcfm at nlo uh, all is good except uh, small uh, differences due to statistics and then we just take all the settings fixed and we produce nlo nnlo predictions and basically, we just end up with uh, the K factor to, to use for an, an NLO fit. Um, OK, and this is my conclusion. So more investigation needs to be done on the Digit CMS from our side, some cutting some bins, as, as Petya mentioned, or, or I don't know, investigating a bit more um, what can we do. Um, the bottleneck also is shown on the level of proton PDF for, for this data set, uh, not only on the nuclear PDF side, which is, uh, which is the, the main problem. Um, yeah, and uh, so far we only completed the Drolian at NNLO for CMSZ, but we're um, we're also working on the on the other data sets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rava. So we have a question by Pavel. Please go ahead. 
Araba, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, wh why did you choose R equal 2.3 for these jets? We know that uh, there will be some uh, instabilities at, uh, in, in, uh, in bo both in the PP calculations, but also as was mentioned in the plenary yesterday. So we have to be careful with the size of the jets in uh, P and A scattering. I haven't mentioned actually, uh, have I mentioned the R I take? I think there was R somewhere on the CMS. No, I haven't mentioned, but, but uh, I can I can read yeah, early slides, please. So is it like slides three or four? Keep going. Uh, like uh, here, yeah. For example, this slide. This is the data, actually. Yeah. So so then you compare it against the theory prediction with the same R, but yeah, this yeah. is a, a pretty small R for for the for the for the calculations. Well, that could be also an additional problem, but this is really the, the data as provided. But you're yeah. saying so. Let me let me get the point. So uh, R zero point three uh, is well, the, yeah. In PP fits, there is significant dependence on the R value, and, uh, and well, because because QCD corrections are, are quite large and they depend on R significantly. In okay. the, in your case, there is also the nuclear effect, uh, as was po pointed out, out by Barbara Yasak yesterday. So so this value of R can be important. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, to, just to summarize, this is uh, data as provided. We, yeah. we... Mm -hmm. okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next question, you. Oh, hi, thanks Rabbi, it's a good talk. Um, can I ask you a question regarding the, uh, the neural network that you're using? Sure. Um, so, so this neural network, it has, um, does it has six um, outputs that yes. for the values, or does it ha um, does it output the parameters that parameterize uh, the uh, distributions? Yeah, um, good point. So uh, what I call here NN is actually the output. So we add on top of the output, we add these factors. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe the picture is confusing. Okay, so how how does the uh, how does it fit um, like speed wise, like how fast is this neural network giving you one replica? So um, just a bit of history um, in the nuclear PDF framework, we were um, we, we because we were writing a new framework, we uh, we introduced a gradient descent uh, like. Uh, as opposed to the NGA that was used in an NPDF 3.1, although now an NPDF 4.0 is using also gradient descent. Mm -hmm. um, and this improved a lot the, the efficiency. So um, you need to keep in mind that we have a lot of, not only fitting a neural network, you have a lot of constraints that we use as well on the chi-square. So these yeah, are- right. hard. So I would say, um, well, I mean, I could give you a number of hours, uh, but uh, also it depends on the cores, right? I mean, uh, it's it means yeah, nothing. Right. I just <laughs> tell you, but um, we can get a fit of two hundred replicas in in one day on on a cluster by not squeezing too much the cores. I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's that's impressive. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, thank you, Rava. Uh, so we move to the. Last talk today by uh, Haik. If you could please share your slides. Thank you. Thanks, Pia. Yeah. Can you see my screen and my voice? Can you hear my voice? Yeah. Okay, uh, then let's let me start. Thank you, Pia, for uh, giving me opportunity uh, for presenting my research. My name is Khair Faik Muzaka, and uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Munster. And today I would like to talk about the impact of um, uh, WZ, WMZ, boson production data, and the compatibility of neutral TIS data in nuclear parton density extractions. I guess this introduction, I, I, all of you uh, are familiar with this, so I will skip. And uh, we can start by talking about the strange quark PDF. Uh, which uh, usually has much larger uncertainty to do limited flavor separations. And at the end, we assume uh, in the old days, we assume this um, simple relation between the, the, the strain C quark and uh, like C quark. 
And although this relation has an origin from isotopic symmetry, uh, this makes um, the PDF, if we use this, uh, then we will have an estimation of uncertainty, especially in the strange PDF. And, but the reason WZ production data from LSC can help us constrain strange PDF, um, you can see from the figure here that um, uh, the, the contribution from um, strange is quite uh, large so that it allows us to, I mean, if we use WZ production data, then it allows us to constrain a strange PDF more. And hence we can depart from these uh, simple relations. And, and hence, this is what, uh, uh, for, Going to ASTEC fit in WZ, uh, I would like to remind you about our uh, NCTEC framework for fitting nuclear PDFs. Uh, so the, the, the full and PDFs is uh, parameterized in terms of the effective bound nuclear PDFs, the bound proton PDFs, and bound neutron PDFs. And we, we assume aspin symmetry. So uh, at the end, we can get the, uh, the neutron, bound neutron PDF from bound proton PDF. And we parameterize the bound proton PDFs at, 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 at this, this input scale, Q0 equal, equal to 1.3 GeV, which is equal to the mass, the char mass, using this parameterization. And uh, then to uh, parameterize the A dependence, we uh, give this uh, coefficient CK, A dependence, actually it should be A and Z. But for simple city, we assume simple a, this simple A dependence. This PK is actually proton PDF parameters uh, from CTEX 6M. And um, we, we do not use uh, uh, parameters in, um, we, we do not use PDF, prim, PDF parameterization in, in terms of a uh, PDF uh, ratio to nuclear PDFs to uh, proton PDFs. Uh, and here, the, the, the advantage of this uh, parameterization is that we, um, that the that each nucleus is now uh, parameterized with the same parameterizations. And for, we assume the same sum rule uh, for the effective bound proton PDFs as this uh, uh, pro free proton counterparts. Yeah, so this is just to remind, to remind you about the Aztec framework that we use uh, for uh, this analysis. And now we come back to Aztec 15WZ, so which is, which is uh, our analysis uh, by adding uh, W and Z uh, uh, production data from NC. Uh, so this is basically an extension of NC Tech 15. But now we, because we have W and Z data, we open, uh, this allows us to open more strange PDF parameters. Uh, at the level of uh, chi square particular freedom, you can see that we have uh, a very good chi square. So it's uh, an excellent fit. And uh, if you look at the data theory comparison, we also have a fairly good agreement between data and theory. At the level of NPDFs, uh, especially if you look at the strange and clone PDFs, which um, those are usually the least constrained flavor where, and we, we hope that WZ data give more constraint on this, uh, on this uh, PDF parameter, on, on these flavors. You, we can look at the strange PDF and uh, you can see that uh, at low X, we have an elevated strange uh, compared to Aztec 15. And also we have much larger uncertainty compared to Aztec 15. And um, we can explain this uh, by uh, uh, looking at the, the fact that uh, we open more strange PDF, we, we open more parameters, especially in the strange PDF. And that's why we have more, uh, we have um, larger uncertainty for the strange PDF. And for the clue one, we you can see that we have a smaller um, uncertainty, and um, this can be understood by the fact that WC data uh, is, is very high in, in Qs in Q and goes to log X. And this region we expect that the NL contributions should be large, then at the end give us an improved concern for the clue one PDFs. If we compare uh, the WZ with other uh, NPDF sets like PDF 16 and, uh, and NPDF 2.0, you can see from the figure that uh, we have fairly a good agreement um, that, is, that um, all answer that depends are overlapping. So I think there's no discernible tension here with other NPDF set. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that answer for the 15 WZ predict the uh, an elevated strain C ratio. 
and uh, in this can be compared with uh, the free um, the free proton uh, fit from atlas so um, here this is uh, the result of the strange ratio from atlas fit so the data is here i think data uh, here plus wz atlas plus um, from atlas and w w plus jet from atlas and you can see that they are very uh, um, similar at low x and this is question whether um, the elevated strength uh, PD, uh, the elevated strength pdfs is actually what nature dictates or is it because lacks of flavor separation or is it because the strange is the least constant flavor so the only way uh, the theory approach the data is by moving uh, strange pdf around such that we have uh, elliptical strange pdf at low x of course without more data sets that can directly constrain a strange pdf we this this is still an open question and speaking about adding more data sets um neutral di data is 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 a candidate to add um it's, it's very important for flavor uh, difference or flavor separations and it, it gives more sensitivity to strange pdf and it's also high statistics we are talking uh, about thousands of data points compared to say hundreds of data points for charge left on the s case um and because of the weak nature of neutrino interaction uh, usually the data sets uh, uh, the experiment uh, uh, are done use, using heavy targets so either iron or lead uh, but in, including or incorporating neutron TIS in a global fit is not as easy as we think because we uh, we, we have we face um, tensions between neutron TIS that, uh, and uh, charge of TIS and um, uh, unfortunately there is no uh definite conclusion or a consensus about the status of whether uh the whether there that have whether there is tension between neutron TS and charge of TS. Uh study by NCT collaboration in 2007, 2009, and 2011. So here I showed the study from 2011 uh using cas squared hypothesis testing that uh, there is no compromise fit of of charge lepton and neutron TS data that can explain for the data well. And it seems that um, if, NUTEF, um, if the correlation of NUTEF data is taken into account in, in the global fit, uh, it, seem, it seems to lower the tensions, but still not enough. Uh, a study by um, the SSC collaboration uh, in their global fit with charge lepton, uh, DIS data, trillion and time production and F2 and F3 data this is much more this is much scarcer data compared to uh, the usual cross section data from NUTEF, Horus, and CHW. Uh, shows out that um, there is no noticeable tension between um, neutrino TIS data and charge of TIS data, although they uh, ignore the correlation of uh, NUTEF. Uh, and also, we have studied by EPPS collaboration using um, uh, Hessian rewriting technique. Um, we saw that if we perform this normalization procedure, then it is it, it might be possible, it is possible to incorporate or to add this neutrino data sets um, into a, co a combined global fit with charge of tantia asset without causing too much tension. Yeah, but uh, this um, although the, they use um, much more high statistic uh, cross-section data, but the correlation is, is, is ignored. This is uh, to be contrasted with um, NCTEC study that. Where the correlation is actually uh, taken into account. Now, our analysis. So, uh, we set the base, uh, which represents charge lepton data as the data set that were used in ASA 15 WC analysis. So, we have TIS, Trillian, Pion, uh, single inclusive Pion protection, W, w and Z protection data from, from LAC. And this base will be contrasted to uh, TAMUNU. This is, let's uh, this is basically a collection of neutrino data sets um, from TAM1, TAM1 reduction data from CCFI and NUTEF, NUTEF itself, um, and CTSW and HORUS. And, and in this time, we properly treat normalization uncertainty. So we use the Akosini method to fit normalization parameters. And uh, furthermore, we uh, take into account correlation uh, from NUTEF and HORUS. And before doing any combined fit with uh, charge lepton data, we do this neutrino alone fit or TAMINU fit. And we have a respectable chi-square of one, 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 seven. 
And uh, as usual, we have quite large um, gas cover data point for, I'm sorry, uh, for NUTEF. But uh, you can see from this, this table. So this is a chi square, uh, the average chi square per data point. And of course, uh, the notion of the chi square per data point for correlated data is quite, un quite ambiguous. So this is the, our definition. If we sum this chi square, um, then we have the total the usual um, chi square um, definition. So this, this, so this is the average um, uh, of this chi square per data point. As you can see that uh, all neutral data sets at low X uh, have consistently a uh, large chi square per data point. And if you look at the heat map, so this is also the same cas average chi square per data point, but per X Q squared pin. You can see that uh, the uh, this this behavior is pretty much independent of Q square, but strong has strong dependent on X. That's why we we argue that. Um, so that's why we have um, in this table. So there is no Q here. And um, now we co we can compare prediction from NSTEC within WZ that represent um, dark Shapton data with the Munu um, neutral alone fit. As you can see that, so this is our F2. So this is F2A divided F2A3. F2A3 is basically F2 computed using this FIA3. This where now FIP is free proton PDF. In our case, it's uh, proton PDF uh, from ctex 6 m our, our base. And as you can see that we have tension um, uh, at low X and also at uh, X around 0 0.6, this is the EMC minimum. So uh, before doing any combined fit with charge of the data, we can uh, start, uh, we can learn two things at least that the tensions um, happen at low X between neutrino data sets, so among neutrino data sets, and tension at low X and X around 0 0.6 with the base, uh, yeah, and with the at, at X, uh, at low X and X uh, around 0 0.6. And um, then we can do the combined fit. Uh, uh, so we do the statistical test uh, to check whether each neutral data sets collectively, individual and collectively uh, compatible based on our compatibility, this our compatibility criteria. Uh, as you can see that only Horus and CHW pass our compatibility criteria. So this, this common criteria is basically 90% confidence level. So the, 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 the combined fit can explain both the data and, and uh, both S and S bar uh, with 90% confidence level. And although base and Horus um, uh, can pass, base Horus and base CTSW pass our compatibility criteria, if you look at the cas square per point uh, at different X, you can see that uh, we have still um, uh, tension, or we have, you can still, we, we have large value of Casco data point. So we still have tension at low X, even for um, base Horus and base CTSW, which we uh, say that they are compatible based on our, our compatibility criteria. Of course, tensions uh, means that we have either the data has some problem, or either the center value and or the errors, or our theory is incomplete. And of course, um, some high twist effect or uh, effect that, that are related to W, heavy W boson that propagate through nuclear mediums or, or other effect that we might not aware of right now could cause this tension. But uh, what if we cut low X data? Uh, what's what happened? And this is what happened um, that we have uh, uh, compatible data sets that no, now neutron data sets individually and collectively. Are, are compatible with uh, with the base or with charge left and data sets. Two minutes. And uh, now we can focus our mind with base demunu uh, with, with the combined fit with and without uh, a low X cut. You can see now that this is the breakdown of Casca per data point. You can see that uh, neutral data sets mainly uh, has tension with some charge left and data set like. Calcium, uh, carbon, and also uh, uh, calcium. Uh, 
if you look at the delta three comparison, you can see that um, uh, as, as expected, the tensions mainly come uh, at low X uh, and, and, and X around 0 0.6. And if we cut low X data, so we apply low X cut, we um, low extension of course largely disappear, but we still have tension at X around 0 0.6. Uh, but because the tension is uh, is not so dominant, then uh, this patient immunity fit can st still pass our compatibility criteria. Um, if looking at the theory comparison for neutral TIS, so this is again uh, the nuclear ratio, this, this definition, uh, you can see that, uh, that including low X neutral tetas in based immune fit, we have much milder shadowing compared to other, to other fits. And finally, this is the RF2 prediction. Um, so, uh, as expected, uh, the base immune uh, that contain low X neutron theta can fit to the new theta, theta more compared to base immune X larger than 0 0.1, which is expected. And we also see that roughly the shape of nuclear correction, the charge uh, current and neutral current nuclear correction is, is the same except at low X. There is some deviation. Yeah. And as a summary uh, for this talk, um, that we still have large uncertainty for strange PDF even after including WNC data from LSC. And also we have an improved constraint for gluon PDF from WZ data. And it seems that the uncertainty in WZ seems to prefer high, higher strength ratio. And speak, uh, regarding the tension between neutrino and charge lepton TIS, um, the tension seems to be maximal at x less than 0 0.1 and x around 0 0.6. And uh, applying low x cut um, reduces the tensions and uh, makes the, the combined fit based on x less than 0 0.1 past the compatibility criteria. Compatibility criteria. And the tension and um, the tension at x around 0 0.6 do not disappear, of course, in based on x 0 0.1 fit. But the tension is, as I said earlier, small enough such that based immune X plus 0.1 fit can still pass our compatibility criteria. And uh, we are now still studying possible sources uh, for, the for this tension, especially at low X and X around 0.6. Thank you. If you have any more, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Yes, no. All right, I, I know we're all very tired. Uh, so if there are no questions, let me give two reminders, please. Any one of you who still speaker in any session in the rest of the week, please upload your talks with a bit of a time margin, just in case. And I will remind you, all of you that we have a meeting place called Gather Town. So if you want to do to go to Gather Town. I know it's a bit late for those who live this side of the Atlantic, but um, it, it's open for anyone. And you can also go and see the recorded flash talks and do our virtual poster session in this way. So I hope to see you all around with a cute avatar in Gather Town. Uh, that's all for today. And we will recombine uh, tomorrow afternoon for me, morning for some of you, and we will continue with the structure function sessions.